Hello, Dan. Welcome to the Grand Slam Journey podcast. So great to have you. Thank you, Claire. It's great to be here. Good to see you. I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. You have a fantastic background. You're currently the managing partner and co-founder of Grand Force Capital. Uh, but before that, you had your own company for eight years, Health Warrior, that you actually successfully exited and sold to PepsiCo. You spent 15 years in investment management industry. And prior to that, you've been passionate about tennis and have played tennis competitively for D1 College. And I'm so curious about pretty much your journey, some of the tennis mindset and all of your career steps and learnings you have had. Uh, that's my quick intro and why I'm so excited to have you on, but I want to hand it over to you. Anything else you want to bring up or highlight uh, that you want listeners to know about you? Uh, well, I think you did a, a great job summarizing my, my background. And again, thank you for having me on the podcast. So wonderful to speak with you. Enjoyed our, our, our prior conversations. I would say professionally, as you mentioned, I'm a former hedge fund manager. I'm an entrepreneur and founder of a business called Health Warrior, and now I'm a managing partner and co-founder of a private equity firm. I'm also, what, what you didn't mention is I'm a proud dad of two kids. I have a six and eight year old, and I really pride myself on the time that I put into parenting and being present with my children. And uh, you talked a little about my tennis career, but I'm just a fitness junkie. Uh, is how I would describe myself. That's my drug. That's where I get euphoric. Uh, <laughs> I've been an athlete since just a little kid where I played every single sport. Then I narrowly got focused in on tennis and then transitioned that into uh, endurance sports and triathlons, mm. marathons, ultra marathons, uh, anything that uh, I can do to get my adrenaline pumping, I, I love doing. So oh. those are the three areas in particular where I spend most of my time these days is, is business, family, and, and my personal health and wellness. Love it. And I've certainly noticed that on your LinkedIn uh, post, and actually somebody tagged me on one of yours where you talked about the book uh, Open, which I've also read. I actually discovered it maybe when Agus even launched it at the beginning, <laughs> and I was going through interesting journey in tennis and you can find so much wisdom about actually tennis and life in it so it's it's always great to get to know these serendipitous connections through linkedin and i uh, look forward to diving into even your extreme i would say sports ultra marathon is uh ultra running is something i definitely not planning on taking on and i feel like it requires just another level of perseverance from people so much of its mindset, right? One one step in front in front of the other is uh, is what I would say. It's probably more of a of, of a mental test than it is physical. Once, once you're at obviously at a, a level where you've trained and you have a, a some sort of base that can you can put yourself into that type of event event, and then it's all it's all up here. You can will yourself, you know, your way through probably your last 10, 15 miles of a fifty mile race, so to speak. Yeah. The most similar thing I would compare to, we do these longer hikes every now and then. We try to schedule them every other year. The last one we did was the Mount Everest base camp. And so it's almost similar. Once you get to the four or 5,000 meter level, you just have to trust one step at a time that you'll eventually get there and just do a foot in front of another. I'm sure it's not the same as ultra running, but um, that's the most I can compare, I guess, from my perspective to your mindset, what you shared. It's, it's very similar. And I've done some mountaineering myself. Uh, I've climbed down in Patagonia, down in Argentina and Chile. Wow. I've climbed Mount Baker in, in, you know, outside of Seattle in the state of Washington. This summer, I'm going to be climbing Mont Blanc, actually, in France. So I've definitely done some mountaineering and especially when you start getting towards altitude, yes, it literally is just about persistence and consistency of one slow step in front of the other and staying balanced. So there's a lot of analogies between ultra endurance you know, events and, and, and climbing mountains for sure. I just love long hikes as, as well. Last year, my, my wife and I hiked the, we did the rim to rim in, in the Grand Canyon, wow. which isn't quite, you know, base camp of Everest or summiting some of the peaks that I've done, but still just an epic hike and, and a great journey. Wow. How long did it take you, the rim to rim? It was like an eight hour sort of endeavor. And that was with stopping down yeah. at the bottom of the canyon and having some lunch. So it, it's a very manageable 
hike for anyone who is reasonably fit. Way to just escape. Not that I was planning on being on my phone or whatnot, but you are, you, you lose you lose uh, internet connectivity anyway once you get into the canyon. So no phones for nearly eight hours or so, and just an opportunity to be outdoors, connect with my wife. We we, we love doing things like that. It's how typically we spend our time together. For, for date nights or a date weekend, it's typically something outdoorsy, some sort of adventure. For our 10-year wedding anniversary, actually, this year, we're going to be hiking in Peru for four days to go to Machu Picchu. Oh, that's a beautiful hike. And I love the food in Peru. It was actually one of the first hikes we have done. And I so underestimated the quality of food because once you do other hikes after, it's like, this food is awful, but they just cook you some of the best food on, you know, in the middle of nowhere, on a fire, and there are amazing cooks there. So I'm sure you will enjoy it tremendously. It's, uh, That's good to know. Uh, no one has really alerted me to focus on, on the food. In fact, all, all the feedback I've received has been, be careful drinking the water, because I've had many people say mm -hmm. that they've gotten stomach bugs from drinking water. So uh, I'll, I'll add that to something that I'm looking forward to. Peru is known for its cuisine. Actually, Lima, I believe, is considered the culinary city of the world. Um, so they have some fantastic food in Peru. I agree with the water, but I think that's everywhere. At least I have a sensitive stomach. So I just take it as part of the experience. Everywhere I go hiking, I just get something. So <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Just, it's, it's just an added thing you got to manage. But it's, it's part of the experience, at least for me. Yes, if you're if you're going somewhere off the beaten path, it, it certainly comes with the territory. In fact, we took our our kids to Morocco, and mm. uh, three out of four of us all got really sick. <laughs> so, at the time, it wasn't so fun. But when I look back on it, it's a little character building, I guess. Yes. Well, I love how we dove in into already hiking, endurance, and outdoorsy things. But I do want to go back even all the way to your upbringing and just better understand what was your upbringing like? You mentioned you did all different sports, but what attracted you especially to tennis? And was there somebody who influenced you? So I grew up uh, on the East Coast in Connecticut. And fortunately, grew up in just a very loving household. I uh, had an older sister and two parents that I just simply would say that I think what I most benefited from was the fact that they truly believed in unconditional love. And that was sort of their parenting strategy was unconditional love. And I think that's just benefited me tremendously as I felt supported as, as a child. They never pushed me in a direction that I didn't want to go necessarily. They let me be who I was. I mean, certainly there were guardrails, uh, but all of my initiatives were self-driven. Uh, all the sports that I wanted to play was just something that I begged to do. And I wanted to play soccer and I want to play baseball and I want to play basketball. And as a young kid, I had posters, all, like many kids, posters all over my walls of all the athletes I, I was inspired by. I had a poster of Michael Jordan. I had a poster of Bo Jackson, Just Do It. I had a poster of, as I got a little older, Lance Armstrong, pre him finding out he was a cheater or, or, you know, whatever his issues were. I still respect him, frankly, for what he's accomplished from an athletic perspective. It's all another story. But uh, now that I remember it, actually, the poster I had was after some of the controversy, mm -hmm. I believe, or maybe it was right at the time. I can't remember. The quote was something to the effect of it showed him like on, on a bike and it said, Thing about like everyone asked me what I'm on and it said what I'm on is my bike like seven days a week five hours a day but you know and it was like a whole quote about sort of basically I'm I'm just training and that's what I'm doing it turned out maybe he wasn't but uh anyway I digress and so grew up an athlete I don't know ultimately what it was at an early age that I sort of started to play tennis and really took a love to the game. My dad did play. So I do remember vividly playing with him. He's actually a very good competitive player. He was probably a, you know, four or five, five Oh type player. So he was a very solid tennis player. I remember growing up playing with him. And then it was around seventh grade when I made the decision that I wanted to specialize and only focus on tennis. Ultimately, I just said, I want to be great at tennis. That was really sort of how it happened and quit all my other sports. And again, it was all from sort of a place where I was the one demanding that I play for my parents. They never pushed me into it. And I kept saying, I want more, I want more, I want more. And that evolved really, I would say, seventh grade, uh, which is around 13 years old, is when I decided to focus on tennis. I would say my parents are influential. And then I was very fortunate to have 
two very influential coaches that have really changed the trajectory of my life, not only in terms of the tennis skills that they taught me, but more importantly around life and have made me somewhat of the introspective and somewhat spiritual person that I am today. Uh, one of one of my coaches was uh, who actually lived with us for a period of time. He was, he was a professional player. Then he became the Argentinian um, Davis Cup coach and a very famous teaching instructor. My dad developed a good relationship with him and a close friendship. And for one summer, he actually lived with us. And then off and on, he spent some time living with us. I developed an amazing relationship with him. This was back in the 1980s. And I grew up in like a very I'm not going to call it blue collar town, but like a, a middle class town in in Connecticut. Uh, wasn't Greenwich, Connecticut, if you sort of know the zip code of Greenwich. And at the time, this coach was a raw vegan. And he also was a Scientologist. Uh, and he exposed me to just things that I could tell you that no kid in my town was being exposed to. Uh, and it was really enlightening. I didn't go on to become a Scientologist, but he took me through, you know, some interesting questions and processes and sh shared his journey of life. And to see someone who was a raw vegan you know, at, at the age of, you know, 13, 14 or so was, was very influential. And then I had another coach, similarly, I, I mentioned I grew up in Connecticut and she was the uh, head women's tennis coach at Yale University. And I trained with her privately. And she also just had a very spiritual approach. She pushed me, pushed me really hard on the court. Don't get me wrong. And she was a masterful coach, but the mind games, you know, sort of helping me navigate the mind game was probably her greatest strength. And she also is a very spiritual teacher. She introduced me to Buddhism. She, she got me a meditation coach. And I learned to meditate when I was in junior high school, which is, again, contrary to anything that anyone was doing at the, at even just call it in the 80s, but let alone where I grew up. And then the last thing also is sometimes if I wasn't playing well and she could tell I wasn't focused, she would literally make me stop playing. She would stop feeding me balls and take me through like a sun salutation for two minutes or so just to, to reorient, reorient my mind. And so two very influential coaches in my life and having parents who were unconditionally supportive was, was instrumental. What stands out to me listening to you, and I've actually heard you talk about it on other podcasts, but I couldn't grasp, I think, the full sense of it until now. It's just this wide span of experiences for even the coaches. And whether it's, as you mentioned, the religious beliefs or meditation type of things, and obviously the physical activity always goes with it, but it seems like you've got such a beautiful diversity and foundation of what people nowadays call this health and fitness and wellness, because that's like all of these trends that are kind of becoming now more popular is like meditation, asking some of the deep questions, connecting to your purpose, knowing your why. And that seems like that really came to you in some ways early on through the influence of your coaches. Very early accurate? on. And uh, mm -hmm. again, as I said, it's been fortunate that I think I'm someone who has been very intentional in my life, very thoughtful. Uh, sure, we can always do better. And that's my, my goal as a human is to, to constantly be a better version of myself. But I think it, it started particularly with these two coaches in, in my in my youth. So I feel very fortunate. Mm -hmm. And it's, what I love is uh, I can't say I keep in regular contact with them. That's been now 30 plus 40 years or so. I'm 46 years old. But uh, it was like a, a year ago, I reached out to both of them and just, you know, shared with them some of my memories and, and every once in a while and exchange an email here or there. And so it's nice that they, they stick with me. And, and, and frankly, what I've actually noticed is there's a reoccurring theme in that. And we'll talk about this maybe a little later. But in the last two years, I started working with an executive coach or a life coach. And this one coach in particular I've been working with has been transformational in my life in, in my later years in adult life. And so there's, there's a theme throughout my life of just finding mentors and people that I admire, uh, that I can learn from, be inspired by. And it's something that I'm going to continue to do for myself. It's also a gift that I'm going to certainly give my children. And as a parent, one of my goals is to just find them extremely motivating, talented coaches, whatever type of coach it is, whatever, you know, they need and they're looking for. But if my son's a soccer player, I'm going to go find him someone unique, not just on the skill side, but someone who also want, can, can sort of serve as a life coach as well. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a commitment I have to, to myself and to my kids. Yeah. But I also want to go back, touch base on your parents and how amazing it was that they were sort of this open and welcoming to allow you to 
have these different experiences because some people, I think, especially when it comes to religion, can get, you know, really kind of steered towards their beliefs in one way. So it seems like they've really been, as you mentioned, this unconditional love, perhaps they were coming from just a lot of you to experience and make your own beliefs and find out what fits and they weren't steering you one or a different direction. Yeah, 100%. They didn't tell me what to believe. And I think they wanted me to go on my own journey and explore. And I, I certainly credit them to to making me someone who's more open-minded and, and tolerant of, of multiple views out there in the world. And so going back to your tennis, I don't know if you still remember what really attracted you to the sport. And I find, obviously, I have my own thing in tennis, but talking to other tennis players, I still find that my guest have their own thing that they really enjoyed. Do you remember when you put yourself in the shoes of the seventh grader, was there something specific that made you say, oh, this this sport is really great. I want to fully focus on it. I played team sports my, my whole life. And I think anyone who knew me or knows me today would say I'm a great team player. But I think I liked the the autonomy and the independence you had on the tennis court. It was It was me against me out on the tennis court, even though you're obviously playing someone else, but you, you, you have to be 100% accountable and responsible for how you show up on the court. And so I think there was probably something that I, I, I ultimately liked about that, that, that level of autonomy and, and the, the demands that it required of putting trust in, in myself. Mm -hmm. And I still, I, you know, I rarely play tennis today, which I do want to get back to it. But every time I step on a court, I have this like amazing wave of nostalgia and, and it feels actually like home to me. When I do step on a mm. court, it, it feels, it feels like home. So I think I just felt comfortable being on a tennis court and I, I had to be accountable for myself. I think that was just ultimately what probably I enjoyed most. Yeah, I'm actually going to play uh, later this evening. So I know what you mean about when you get on the court, it's almost like your second nature. How often do you play now, Dan? You mentioned not very often, but... I mean, literally never. I've, I've, I've played twice or three times in the past, like, three years for context. And, yeah. and before that, probably was one time in five years. So sadly, I just don't play. I've prioritized other fitness endeavors. As I mentioned, I got really into doing triathlons for a period of time. And so uh, I was competing in everything from, you know, short distance triathlons to doing some Ironmans in my career. I've done several marathons. I've been doing a lot of Spartan races as well. So with, with a demanding job and with a family, I've just deprioritized tennis, but it is something that I, I keep saying there will be a point in my life where I'll get back to it. I, and I think I'm getting closer and closer, but somehow all these other initiatives and, and fitness endeavors just keep taking precedent, maybe because there's newness to some of them. I didn't grow up yeah. skiing and I started skiing later in my life. In the last two years, I've discovered skiing and I'm, I'm obsessed with it. And there's a, there's a history and sort of a track record of myself. When I do things, I kind of go all in. Mm. I'm pretty intense about it. And so <laughs> my winters now are, are pretty much all focused on skiing on the weekend. So no time to go play tennis. We, we both, we're fortunate to live here in the, in the San Francisco Bay area and can drive up to Tahoe on a weekend and ski all nice. weekend. And then also most recently I've, I've gotten back into swimming again, and I'm, I'm currently training for a three and a half mile ocean swim. So mm -hmm. there's only so much time in a day, uh, that, uh, I, I just haven't prioritized tennis, but it'll, it'll, it'll come back in my life so that I know it's going to all come yeah. full circle. Well, I'll you be have 90, all of these 95 winning uh, club championships. You have all of these activities that actually take a lot of time. And practicing three and a half miles swim, that takes a lot of hours just itself to get into the swim routine. I mean, running, definitely, especially the long distance that you run. I mean, skiing, you can spend the whole weekend, as you mentioned, on the hill and always be excited to ski more, at least for me. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's tough to prioritize other things. It is. Um, and, and I would say number one is I've gotten really good about how to be efficient training, you know, in terms of the, the, the actual workouts I do, as opposed to just going out when I'm training for a marathon and just slogging out 50, 60 miles a week, working in sprints and hills so you can compress the, the time that I'm training. Yeah. I've also been known for, I love solitude on runs, but I've also been known for doing a lot of work calls on, you know, casual work calls while I'm running yeah. or 
putting on a weight vest and walking for 30, 40 minutes just so I get in some, some miles and reps. And then also I'm someone who is extremely disciplined how I spend my time. Uh, I manage my calendar to the minute. Uh, I think you're, you know, you're aware I have an executive assistant that helps manage my calendar. She knows exactly so when I want to plan my calls, how I schedule my work day, when I need the time to exercise. And, and frankly, for me, yeah, there's always these these quotes around so anyone's, you know, while everyone's sleeping or it's dark. And, and that's kind of typically what I do uh, is, you know, try to, I'm up early five in the morning and my workouts are before my kids even wake up in an ideal world. Uh, so headlamps, you know, for runs, my pool opens at six, I'm home by 6.45 if I get in a 30, 40 minute swim, you know, and then see my kids and get to the office pretty quickly thereafter. So it's, it, there's definitely a lot of re regimen, you know, and, and strategic planning around my calendar. Mm -hmm. I actually want to connect it back to your upbringing because it becomes the same when you play tennis or any sport for that matter early on in your childhood. I think a lot of athletes become naturally very effective and very aware of the time investments because you're always shuffling many things, school, then practice, uh, back and forth. I actually was listening to some of the podcasts you were on. You were also passionate about entrepreneurship and business early on. Seems like you're starting your own racket stringing uh, sort of venture when you were in the teenage years. So I'm curious, tell me about uh, that synergy and how that idea even came about. My father was a, a doctor and my mom started her career as a teacher and then sort of scratched her artist itch and did some art for a while and then ultimately translated that into becoming an interior designer. And so... Sure, they were business minded, but they weren't in, you know, mm. they weren't running massive companies. They weren't in the corporate world. Uh, but I always had an interest in, in business at a young age. And yes, uh, when I was a young teenager, I started a racket streaming business. It was called Cross Strings. And I had business cards. I was making, you know, promotional collateral, putting posters and advertisements at all the country clubs, at all the public tennis courts, and created frankly, quite a business. Uh, you probably know from, from your tennis days, it, for a good racket stringer, it takes 20 minutes, 15 minutes to string a racket. And back then in the 1980s or 90s, when I was doing this, I was getting $10 a, a racket. You know, that was my, my profit. I would charge $10 for the labor and then for the string costs. And so, you know, I was making almost $40 an hour, $30 an hour, which is well above minimum minimum wage today even. And certainly back then for a kid who was, you know, 13, 14 years old, and so I was making real good money and I, my dad taught me sort of like how to keep track of all of my, of, of all of the, the customers. I had a customer spreadsheet. I had nice. sort of tracked all, of, all of the, um, all the sales and revenues when people paid me. Um, and eventually I became quote unquote, I don't know if like, you know, I, I've received any award for this, but I was the, uh, the, the main or the official racket stringer for the Yale women's tennis team. I mentioned one of my coaches was the, yeah. was the head coach. And a team of, you know, typically 12 people on a college team or so, I was getting, you know, 20 rackets a week or so and hustling, you know, down in my basement, stringing tennis rackets uh, all, all year. So it was, it was phenomenal. So that was my first, uh, I guess you could say, entrepreneurial endeavor. Yeah. It takes some skill. I actually tried stringing my own tennis rackets because, as you mentioned, it's expensive, even paying somebody else. So we got a stringing machine. And I never could figure out the tension to a point where I really actually believed and trusted myself, like string my own tennis rackets. I probably could have strung for some amateurs, but I didn't get to the 15, 20 minutes that you got, Dan. So that takes a lot of volume. I appreciate just alone to actually get the process down and be swift with your hands, getting the string through to get to that 15, 20 minute per racket time. Well done. It was great. And talk about a lifestyle business. I remember in the summer, bringing my stringer outside in my backyard and would just stand on my parents' deck, stringing rackets for two hours or so, making some money in the summers. It was wonderful. So good, good, good start to my business career. So transitioning to college uh, years, you ended up uh, accepting a D1 scholarship, uh, playing tennis, Tell me a little bit about that transition and even how did you pick the college uh, you chose for yourself? Unfortunately for my parents, uh, it was not a scholarship, <laughs> so, oh. but, I, but I did get recruited to play. Uh, it was always my dream to play college tennis. I was loving tennis, you know, obviously throughout high school. Interesting stat, my last high school tennis match, 
I lost in the state, I think it was semifinals, I don't, uh, to James Blake. Oh. Coincidentally, James and I trained together uh, for years, and we had the same coach, Brian Barker. I, I grew up playing with James, actually. He was a couple of years younger than me. He was, I was a senior. I think he was a sophomore. So I think he was two years younger than me when he beat me in that, my last high school match. But uh, I knew I wanted to go on to play college tennis. How I chose the school, uh, gosh, it was a long time ago. But I don't even know how I ended up there other than I visited the school as I was visiting a lot of schools in mm. more predominantly in the Northeast of, 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 of you know, the United States. And my parents took me on a lot of college tours. It's when I had some friends who went there. And so also picked a school based on, you know, GPA, grades, tennis. So I guess if I had to think about it, how I chose my school, it started out looking at my grades and looking at my GPA and looking at my SAT scores. What are the schools that I was capable of getting into? And fortunately, I was a good student. And so focused mostly on sort of schools really in the top sort of 20, 30 of, of the United States. Uh, then it came down to sort of, you know, what size school, what type of school, and also could I play tennis? And so through that process, mm. uh, I had some of the Ivy Leagues as quote, quote unquote, my reach schools. So the Ivy, the, the tennis was even more competitive than Colgate, even though Colgate mm. was a D1 school and academically. And I was kind of on borderline, to be really honest. Uh, I probably could have gotten on one of the, 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 the you know, N or Yale teams, probably could have gotten on academically, but it was not a sure thing. And at the time, Colgate was kind of a sure thing based on my academics and sort of the team and the coach's assurance that you're probably getting in based on your tennis and, and your academics. And so I decided to apply early. And after visiting the school, I loved it, met a whole bunch of the students, met a bunch of the players and fell, fell in love with the school. Yeah. How was your experience? How would you sum it up? Look, reflecting on your college tennis years, including again, business schedule, going back to timing and time management as an athlete, you always shuffling so many things. One, one thing that is that I did not complete, I didn't play all four years. And so I did get burnt out after, um, after, after my first year even of playing. And so I ended up not playing my full four years, which I, uh, Looking back on, I typically am someone who doesn't try to have regrets in my life because I'm just going to be happier with where I am today. But I would say it was definitely something I look back on and question whether that was the right choice. It clearly was the right choice because, again, I am where I am. And that's, you know, the choices you make, you can't change that. Certainly, you learn a lot as an athlete, you know, around time management in particular. That was like, you know, as much as I was managing my time in high school, I think it was like a real wake up call to manage sort of particularly layering in the social component of college school I went to is definitely a very social school and wanted to also sort of immerse myself in, in making friends and having some fun along the way. And so definitely a wake up call, but felt like I was relatively prepared and, and trained for, for all the time management skills that I needed to apply overall between my time as a tennis player, as well as the time as I wasn't playing, I had a phenomenal college experience, loved, loved every aspect of my college experience and some of my closest friends. Uh, that I met during the college years are today, they are my closest friends, uh, which if, if nothing else, and I can just look back on the bonds and friendships that I created to have a couple of friends that, you know, will be best friends for life. And you've gone through years and years of experiences with, then I'm, I'm thankful if nothing else for that. And so through college, it seems like you then transitioned right away to the financial and investment management um, industry. You started after college, your first role with Thomson Reuters, which sounds really interesting. So I'm actually even curious, um, based on what you studied, how did you uncover this first role in kind of finance and investment management? How do you reflect on it? And even anything you have taken, as you now shared, like from your college and tennis experience that you see helped you excel in that first role that is, I'm sure, very demanding. Yeah, so so interestingly enough, I studied both economics and religion at school. Colgate was a liberal arts school, so they didn't even have a finance degree that if you or engineering mm -hmm. if you wanted to pursue that. It was a liberal arts education, which the whole philosophy of liberal arts education is to ultimately train you how to think. Uh, and so that's exactly what I did. And it was interesting that I chose religion because I'm actually not very religious, but I think ultimately all of those influences that we started talking about earlier in yeah. the podcast, 
uh, around the coaches that I had, introducing me to Scientology, to Buddhism, uh, that ultimately, I think, probably just piqued a curiosity in religion, in philosophy, in psychology. And so, yet I still had this sort of business side in me, the, the, the entrepreneur who started cross strings. And at a very young age, I used to have a fascination with the stock market, interestingly enough. In mm. fact, I was home uh, a, a year or so ago and my mom had like a scrapbook and I saw in a letter or, or a, a essay I wrote as like a young kid as early as like fifth grade or so talking about my fascination in the stock market. It actually mm. was 1987 because it was about the, 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 the market crash. And I talked all about it and I actually said, I want to work in the stock market. I mean, probably really, really fully appreciate what that was at age 10. I, I studied both economics and religion. And ultimately, my first job out of school was in consulting. And it really came through a position through career services that a former alum ran a division in this consulting group at, at Thomson Reuters. Previously, it was a, a company called Carson Group. It was a small cons financial consulting firm. I went through all of the interviews for investment banking, which a lot of people, you know, the traditional large banks. And the reality was I really had an affinity and an attraction to a smaller organization. And, and there's a recurring theme of that in my entire career. I really have never gone and worked for a large, you know, Fortune 500 type, you know, size of company. I've always appreciated a more intimate type of setting and somewhere where, frankly, that I feel like I could have more responsibility, more autonomy and shine mm -hmm. a bit more which maybe goes back to what I was saying, what I appreciate about tennis and being on the court. And so I spent a year there and uh, really enjoyed it and worked with some amazing people. And then just coincidentally got an opportunity to go and transition to the buy side and go over to the hedge fund uh, industry. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I, I realized after being in consulting, I, I learned a lot at the time, but I still had a real interest in investing. That was really, as I said, mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of day trading and, and just investing on my own with my boss, actually, who was a, you know, my boss of my group. He was a couple of years older and he also was very interested in the markets. And so while we're at work on the side, I'm also like managing a portfolio. And then when I got the opportunity to go to a hedge fund, I was obviously really excited about that. And so took that opportunity to go there. And that was only one year after I worked. And I'll share, I'll share one story that I'm, I'm always proud of, of sharing. And I think it tells a lot about who I am and going back to sort of a little about sort of the influence I had from my parents. But when I started my first job, my dad said, I'm going to give you one piece of advice as you start your career. And he said, you're the first person there and the last person to leave. And I did that every single day for a year. So when I left my consulting firm, and I can't make this story up, when I told sort of like the senior boss that I was leaving, mm -hmm. she literally said, wow, she's like, I can't believe that. She's like, it seemed like you're so happy here. You're always the first guy here and the last guy to leave. And she goes, well, actually, it makes sense that you're leaving now that I think about that. But I went home and I told my dad that, and he said, he just like nodded his head and he said, yep, that's, that's the type of work ethic you want to have in your life. And so I've always had that mentality. And so that, that served me very well. So it was a great start to my career, worked with some great people. And again, that, that, that persistent attitude, working, you know, working long hours, putting in effort paid off and set me up for the next 15 years of my career. I do want to go. A little bit deeper into the consulting because you made it sound like studying religion and economics naturally like led to consulting, which I don't see the connection there in some ways, like two extremes. But how did that lead you down towards that? I'm curious. Yeah, you know, it's funny. My, my mom used to always say, she said, you're either going to become a park ranger or someone working on Wall Street. And for whatever reason, as I was, you know, in my junior and senior year and started working with career services and developing mm. a vision for what my future would look like, it was pretty clear that I wanted to move in the direction of business. And so through that, started doing, you know, typically all the big banks and consulting firms yeah. come and interview on campus. And so I started getting exposure to investment banking and consulting and ultimately chose the consulting route. It, there, there wasn't that much more to it than that. Yeah. And my sister is in actually investment banking. I do know she has a lot of friends in consulting. And so being first person in and last person out, 
that's some really long hours. Curious. <laughs> when did you have to be in the office and when were you leaving then? Uh, now you're asking me a question from 24 years ago, but I, I don't know what the exact hours were, but I, I worked long hours and I did the same thing for, at my hedge fund. Uh, for, for a long time to the point where I literally kept a pillow under uh, in my office and would often sleep overnight, not just like a nap, but I did many mm. overnights just because I'd be at the office till 10 o'clock at night. And I just say, might as well not even go home because I need to be back in at seven. And literally yeah. just, you know, in New York, you could just order food to your, to your office and have a dinner and I'd just sleep under my desk. <laughs> I'm actually curious about your perspective as you look back and your what seems really successful as well, 15 years in the investment management industry. Again, I am looking at it from a lens of my sister just kind of peeking in and seeing what she's going through. To me, it looks like a very hierarchical type of industry and organization to where you're literally almost at the beginning go through this burnout to where... It's like the toughest ones who survive. Uh, it seems like early on, they just put you through so much and you work until three and four that I know many people actually can't even handle it physically. So especially if you're someone who needs a lot of sleep, it's not a job for you. And those people sort of drop out early on within the first one, two, three years. And sort of the ones that <laughs> survived the first two, three years, then you kind of progress and climb the hierarchy. But how do you reflect and even anybody who's looking to maybe enter the industry or is part of it, what are your tips looking at it retrospectively? You've got to, you've got to really want it. Yes, 100%, because you are going to work really long hours. You're going to work hard, you know, and you're going to be pushed. Uh, and so you've got to want it. And for whatever reason, I think I'm just someone who's used to going back to sort of my personality what I learned as an athlete, I like being pushed. I, when, when, I'm into, when, when I get into something, mm -hmm. I just want to do the best I can. I want to prove to myself. I want to prove to other people. And so I just took that mentality. So at the time, I don't think I even, it was, it was kind of an afterthought where I wasn't sitting there saying, this sucks. This was, it was my decision. We all have a yeah. choice in life to decide how we want to spend our time. My parents didn't tell me to do that. I think they thought like it was crazy probably. Uh, and so it was just all self-motivated of this is what I want to do. This is exciting to me. I love the, the nature of the deal. And also what I would share is I worked really long, hard hours at my, at my hedge fund, but again, it was all self-motivated. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the head of my firm, a gentleman by the name of George Weiss, who just actually, uh, just last week after 42 years of running the hedge fund, uh, just announced sort of that he was retiring and shutting down the firm. But he was an amazing individual and an amazing human who at, at, at sort of an amazing investor who had been wildly successful, making tons of money, but a, an incredible philanthropist and someone who really believed in treating his employees as, as humans, whereas a lot of investment banking firms and hedge funds did not do that. And it's probably if I could actually give, you know, not only myself credit, but certainly can give him credit for creating a culture that was very unique in finance. Um, mm -hmm. you know, a story that I can share is that during my first review, I was two years out of college. I spent one year there. There was only about, at the time when I joined, 19 people at the firm. So again, history of, of and track record of finding small, more intimate places where you're treated with respect and you can be valued and you can get a lot of autonomy and have independence. So there was only about 19 or 20 people. And I reported to another person, but at the end of the year, George... Uh, you know, sat down with me for a year in review. And after my review, I got up to shake his hand and say, thank you. And he grabbed my hand, but he pulled me in and gave me a hug. And he said, we don't shake hands. You're part of the family. Mm -hmm. And I think it was when you have someone like that working on Wall Street, who was worth hundreds of millions of dollars, treating you though, like a human and a family member and being compassionate mm -hmm. and empathetic, that's probably contributed equally to sort of just my desire to win and, and work hard. Uh, because I worked for just a, a really good person and all the people at the firm, I think that they were there for that reason as well. Whereas mm -hmm. there were certainly people who had gone through our firm and left to maybe go to bigger firms or maybe they could have made more money even. But if you really wanted to sort of have a different type of, of, of relationship with your coworkers, then it made a lot of sense. And so I think that that contributed to my longevity. 
and and that's that's also as we talk a little about sort of my current firm i'd like to think we have a very unique culture within private equity and how we're treating our employees and how i think about employees because of how i was treated and respected i'm actually wonder there's so much of talks about bad culture now it seems like you are really i don't want to say lucky but in some ways mindful where you going to so any other tips of helping people find that leader or that company that fits them? Because it seems like what really stands out to me as I'm listening to you, you were aware quite early on of like the environments that are a fit for you and were able to find them and then distill, I guess, from the job chaos, which ones are a better fit versus aren't. Yes, I, it's definitely something that I've been very intentional about and in thinking about, you know, what type of environment do I do I thrive in? What are the feelings that I want when I show up to work? Who are the types of people I want to work with? What are my what are what is my personal mission? What is the firm's person you know mission? What are my values? What are the firm's values? How do they work? What are the expectations? Is it hierarchical uh, or is it more of a meritocracy? And you talked about the hierarchical nature of a lot of finance firms. Fortunately, I worked at a firm for 15 years that was not hierarchical. Uh, typically in the in the pecking order of, of the hedge fund world, you have portfolio manager, you have analyst, and you have trader. And typically, that's kind of like the pecking order, so to speak. And what was interesting is by the time I was 30, I was a portfolio manager. They were an I had analysts who were actually older than me. Uh, and so if you did well and you were someone who proved yourself as, as you know, mm. I don't like saying this in, in, in those terms, but a moneymaker, which is what you needed to be in the hedge fund industry, yes. you were awarded a lot of independence and autonomy. So I was managing my own team at a very young age. And I said, I had people working for me who were older. So there was there were very little hierarchical structure, the firm that I worked at for, for 15 years, which I thrived in. And again, so going back to your question, you have to know sort of what where where you do well. And some people like working within that regimented and say, oh, well, if I start here and I do this and I jump through this hoop and I get here and I see my path, uh, I don't think I looked at it as, linear, as linearly. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of work to be done. In fact, we have an operating advisor that works with us by the name of Andre Martin, and he just published a book called Wrong Fit, Right Fit. And it's exactly about mm -hmm. this. It's not just necessarily everyone talks about culture. You know, and saying, oh, I want to work at a firm that has a great culture, but you need to know yourself first to understand sort of how you work best before you just say, oh, well, they've got a great mission or vision. You need to understand sort of what resonates with you and set yourself up for success in that type of environment. So I, I think, mm -hmm. yes, I've been very thoughtful and intentional about that. And that's, that's what I certainly would encourage most people to do. And I'll give yeah. you know, a, a pitch for his book. He actually takes you through in his book what he calls excursions. And it's a whole chapter dedicated to questions that you can ask yourself. And it's almost like a, a you know, it's a questionnaire. Then he even has a Mad Libs-like type, you know, sort of uh, form to fill out that ultimately spits out sort of mm -hmm. a bit of a framework for you to really understand, you know, what type of workplace and what type of job even is most appropriate for you. And I think there's also for young kids, you know, and young students or whatnot, there's plenty of resources, books or career services that they at least do tests like these. You can do personality mm -hmm. assessments, right? Enneagrams, Myers-Briggs. There's a lot of different assessments you could do to really just start understanding, you know, how you work, who you are, what your goals are. Yeah. I'll check out the book. Thanks for the I'll send uh, you a recommendation. Copy. We've got, a, we've got yeah. a, a bunch of copies here at the office. Thank you. That'd be fantastic. I appreciate it. But I, I do want to go, when we're back to your career on the health warrior and you deciding to start your own business, because I totally see, as you're explaining your path, this entrepreneurship, kind of the drive towards health, fitness. It seems like you discovered chia seeds, going back to even your upbringing raw vegan. But at the same time, you have had this, what seems like amazing culture, amazing job and career through your investment uh, management industry and background. So what was that jump about and what made you decide, you know what, 15 years in this industry is great. I'm now going to start and build something on my own. Yeah. So the seeds for starting this company, Health Warrior, that I co-founded began with a book. 
a book called Born to Run, which is all about this tribe that lives in the Copper Mountains of Mexico. They're known as the Tarahumara, and they're known for their incredible endurance running feats. Their whole society revolves around running because they live in the mountains and the only way they can get around places is by foot. And then they were discovered because they started entering sanctioned ultra endurance uh, races. And, it, and there was an, uh, a writer who started covering ultra endurance marathons and discovered these, these men and women running these hundred mile races, wearing these flowing robes and running barefoot most of the time. So he ended up writing this book, Born to Run, which most people ultimately know Born to Run for just this incredible story of the Tarahumara, but also for the barefoot runners, right? because that was what they were known for. And then if you recall 15 years ago or so, the Vibram Five Finger Shoes that became popular, so mm, much yeah. of that was all because of this book that came out and talking about the mm. natural way to run is barefoot. And if you look at modern shoes, it puts you in a, in a unnatural foot position. So anyway, in the book, though, they also talk about the, the health benefits of chia seeds because all of these runners would consume chia seeds during their run. Those were their energy gels, so to speak. And so as at the time I was training for Ironmans and I was naturally intrigued by chia seeds, started consuming them my, myself, noticing a real difference in terms of my energy levels. And then I started telling a lot of people about them, people, my, my sisters, that I stopped drinking coffee because I felt so good and it was became part of, of her daily habit. And at the time, it was just myself and uh, I had a, a, my, one of my business partners at my hedge fund. We started, were experimenting together with the chia seeds. He was a former D1 football player and he was also noticing the health benefits. And so together we said, there's a business opportunity here. One of the ways I was inspired was I was an early investor in a beverage brand called Zico Coconut Water, which we'll come to because it comes full circle because now my business partner at Ground Force was the founder of Zico Coconut Water which his name is Mark Rampola. What Mark had done with Zico was take a product that was indigenous to another part of the world, coconut water, extremely mm -hmm. healthy and relatively unknown in the United States. And he said, I'm going to brand it and bring this to the, to the U.S. and had tremendous success with that. So I saw what Mark had done with Zico and coconut water and, Mar and my partner, business partner, Nick, and I said, we can do this with chia seeds. And so we sought out to go start this company. What we realized, though, is obviously starting a company while running a hedge fund uh, is very demanding. And in comes my old college roommate and best friend at the time and currently today, uh, who was in between jobs. And we said, hey, we think we have an interesting business opportunity here. We're really busy working, you know, our day job, so to speak. We can't take calls with, you know, people from Mexico trying to, in Bolivia, trying to source chia seeds in the middle of the trading hours. That's not very responsible. And we said, why don't you help us? And from, from that moment on, Shane uh, joined us as sort of initially just sort of a consultant, but ultimately became a co-founder with us when we all officially said, let's go launch this business. And so Shane actually became the CEO. Nick and I decided actually we were not going to leave our day jobs. Just like uh, hedge fund traders, we hedged ourselves mm -hmm. and we decided to keep our day jobs, which was paying the bills to fund the business. And we funded the business for at least the first year and put in a decent amount of capital to get it off the ground mm -hmm. to pay. You know, Shane, obviously Shane had equity in the business with us as an owner in the business. And from that moment on, you know, we were very instrumental in the business, but we weren't running it day to day. So I kind of got to eat my cake um, and with this expression, yeah, have my cake and eat it too, uh, by still maintaining sort of my investment role at, at a large hedge fund, but also now having this entrepreneurial endeavor on the side. And I was very involved early on in the development of the company. I was part of interviewing every single candidate. I was part of the ideation of the brand name, sitting there with the marketing firm. When we came up with the name Help Warrior and looked at you know 50 other names and designs, it was really exciting that we were building this business on the side. And I got to be involved in, in the ideation and the startup phase, but also still was able to maintain you know, my, my role as a partner at, a, at, a, at, a, at the hedge fund. I'm curious how much the hedge fund and obviously understanding the investments and financial world helped you in taking on then building your own company, Health Warrior. And if you look at that, are there also some things that, oh, I haven't anticipated this. Maybe actually building my own company is not as easy while I do have all of this financial and kind of probably you had access to CEO and very influential people who are building successful businesses, what it's like to actually have and live your own experience? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And what I would say is the 
biggest realization for me was the human capital side of business and managing people and personalities because our hedge fund, while we were a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, and even when we had 30 or $50 million positions in companies, we were investing predominantly in mid and large cap companies. And so I'm not involved in running the company. I'm looking at sort of their financials. I'm looking at industry trends. I'm not so close to the companies that I understand all of the underworkings of how their team is coming together and the and and you know the time and attention it requires to keep a team happy, to keep them motivated, to keep processes moving forward. And so I think that was probably the biggest wake up call for me was how to find talent, how to manage talent, and then how to retain talent as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that was sort of the the, the biggest wake up call to me. Uh, and I'm 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 going to to say something that might sound a little controversial. Uh, but I'm going to share it because it is something that, you know, I've seen, but you talked about sort of the, 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 the demands in finance. What I also learned is that, you know, while people are, are very committed in finance and banking and the hedge fund world to work a 60, you know, a 70, 80, sometimes 90 hour weeks, that's not so much in, in a lot of other roles. And so I think my expectations of some of the, you know, of, of employees we started hiring were probably like, wait, why aren't you working around the clock? Why aren't you answering emails, you know, at midnight when I'm sending an email? So it took some adjustment to understand that, you know, not everyone wants to dedicate their entire life to a business. That said, I think we found some really passionate people that, you know, we created work-life balance, but they really were, were passionate about what we were doing. And I think we had a, a company that was motivating them to work hard and created the right incentives and gave everyone equity in the company on our team and gave them certain adventure days because it was a very, you know, health oriented business. And so adventure days were days where you could just take a random day off and go skiing if there was great powder and you're on the West Coast. But then we just asked you, you know, ask the team member to come back and report on it, share pictures, write a little story about it. So I think we created a great culture where people were motivated to, to work hard. But that was definitely also a bit of a surprise for me. I want to touch on what you mentioned, the market trends. So I'm curious, because you've been doing this financial analysis and investments, when you were investing your own money uh, to health earlier and you feel like, oh, this really should work, were you actually doing some of the analysis as well on the market? Or was it all just intuition because you've had that background, you've kind of maybe seen what's happening in the world and you so believed in it? And certainly in the investment management industry, whether it's today and or at my fund, we did a lot of, yeah, you know, there's no in, intuition is not the way you invest. You know, they, they always talk about emotionless, emotionless investing. Uh, everything we did was, was certainly rooted in a lot of financial analysis, a lot of trend analysis, a lot of data analysis. When I really think about how we started HealthWare, there was definitely a, a lot more probably intuition and gut as it relates to sort of mm -hmm. the business. And it was something that I, I, yeah, I think I had a pretty good pulse on the market. I knew where trends were moving in terms of people who are looking for better for you products. I saw, as I said, I had this intimate knowledge of my, part, my current business partner, Mark's business, Zico. There were a few other businesses that I was watching emerge in brands. And, you know, vitamin water was like a huge success. You know, that was a better for you Gatorade, so to speak, and a better for you hydration product. At the end of the day, it's still not better for you at all, really. But at the time it was. And so I think I saw a lot of data points, but I wouldn't mm -hmm. say this was such a quantitative, uh, top-down driven decision where I said, okay, here are all the trends and here's the next superfood that's going to emerge. We found chia seeds. We knew the trends were moving in the favor of people moving towards mm -hmm. better for you and healthy snacking and nutrition. And we said, let's do this. And so in 2018, you have been able to build an impressive company. It seems like a fantastic culture and you decide to sell it to PepsiCo and exit. And now you started and co-founded Grand First Capital. But I'm actually curious about the reasons for the exit. How did it feel? Because one thing is once you exit, obviously, hopefully you get amazing amount of money for it. But that exit of building something from scratch and then leaving it, what was that feeling like? While we were self-funding for the first year or two, we then raised friends and family capital. And then we did raise money from a private equity firm. 
And so the reality is, and I can say this as someone who understood this going in to having taking private equity money as well as now being on that side of private equity. Mm -hmm. When you take private equity money, there is a gun to head at some point typically where their model relies around selling businesses and returning capital to their investors. And so I knew that at some point we were going to be selling this company and I frankly was okay with it from the perspective I knew what their business model was and I knew what the return expectations they had for their business. And also, frankly, I also was looking at this as, as an entrepreneurial endeavor that I was looking, you know, I'm not embarrassed to say, to make money. And so I could sell the yeah. business and, and make a certain amount of money for myself, for my investors, for my friends and family, then I thought that would be a wonderful success. And then, you know, you'd like to think, and we could talk a little about this, that when you do sell to a large company like Pepsi, they have even farther reach to bring what we believe was a genuinely much healthier product on the market to the masses. It didn't work out that well, um, ultimately, because Pepsi sort of ultimately didn't do much with the brand. And uh, so there was some, some remorse around that in seeing that the brand kind of died under Pepsi's ownership. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I was very comfortable with saying, this is a business and we have investors and that's what their goals are. And so when the time came to selling, there was some controversy, you know, at the time that we sold the business because candidly, yeah, we had inbound interest from Pepsi and Nestle and a few other companies just because our brand was growing really quickly. Uh, we were at the time the number one best-selling bar in the natural channel. Uh, Chia was like kept, if you look back to sort of 2017, 18, it was always being called like the hottest food trend, like always like the top five for those two years. So we, we got, you know, you want to call it lucky, you want to call it sort of forward looking, but we just happened to have a company that uh, was in the right place at the right time. And so we had a lot of interest. So myself and, and my partners wanted to hold on to it for another two years. But at the end of the day, you know, private equity firm had more consent rights with respect to what the ultimate outcome was for this company. And so they said, this is the time to sell. When you have bidders knocking mm -hmm. on your door, you hit the bid. And frankly, they were right. I, like at the time, as I said, there was some, there was some tension. And looking back on it in, as a founder, as well as even as now sitting in my, my seat today, I think it was the right choice. And, and again, everything works out for a reason because it ultimately was a great springboard for me to then go start a new career in doing what I'm doing today, investing in emerging food and beverage and food service and food tech companies. So maybe we sold and left some money on the table, but it all works out because I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. Let's dive into that experience because even looking at your career on LinkedIn and obviously listening to you, it literally seems like the quote from Steve Jobs, you can't connect the dots looking forward, but you can always connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust in something like karma. And it just seems so beautiful how everything you've described from back your beginning and upbringing seems like really converging now, including your experience through investment and industry and building your own business to now being the co-founder and managing partner of uh, Grand Force, uh, which I've kind of looked at your website and I love what you guys do and uh, the principles, obviously, how you invest. So tell listeners a little bit more about that and even maybe what the name stands for. Yeah, happy to do that. But I'll, I'll, I'll interject real quickly when you just talked about Steve Jobs quote. That's great. Um, and it reminds me of someone who I am very inspired by. So I have a, in front of me in my office, I have what I call an inspiration wall and it's all pictures of people or I have some book covers on there. I have a letter that my son wrote me, uh, that inspired me. And one of the photos that I'm looking at now is it's a triptych of Arnold Schwarzenegger as a bodybuilder, as the Terminator and as the governor. And if you sort of just look at, I, I'm so inspired by what he's done because first off, I'm sure when he was a bodybuilder, he never thought he was going to be an actor. And when he was an actor, he probably never thought he was going to be the governor of California. And it turns out that he just excelled in all of these different areas in three very distinct careers. But if you look back now, you can connect all the dots. But certainly you never, I'm sure Arnold yeah. at age 17, when he came over to America, never would have been able to sort of connect the dots forward to what, what he's uh, achieved over his last you know, 70 years or so. Uh, so that's been very inspiring to me. And that, I actually never heard that quote, but I, I love that. I'm going to go find if he gave that in a speech it's, that certainly resonates with me. I'll share this speech with you. I have it saved. Yeah. yeah. 
Please. So to answer your question, you asked about Ground Force. What is what does it stand for? So so first off, the, the history of our firm is that we act. Uh, it's evolved quite a bit, and I joined as the a couple of years ago as the fourth partner in a firm that was previously known as Power Plant Ventures, where we were investing predominantly in businesses focused around plant-based nutrition. Uh, the thesis was ultimately that you know plant-based nutrition was better for human health as well as for planetary health. And so I had some partners who started a first fund focusing exactly on that. I joined when we were raising our second fund, but ultimately sort of for, for various reasons, it evolved to the point where we ultimately Two of my, my partners decided to step away from the business. My partner, Mark, and I decided that we were going to move forward. And we ultimately decided we wanted to change our strategy, to broaden our strategy. We wanted to change our name. We hired pretty much an entire new team. And so today we're operating under Grand Force. And when Mark and I were thinking about sort of the name, we worked with a marketing agency and we ultimately had sort of two main messages that we wanted to convey. You know, everything we do as a firm Everything is 100% you know, commercially driven from a, a financial return perspective. But we also do, as you see, have this sort of halo around us around impact. And we genuinely want to continue to focus on businesses that are focused on promoting human, you know, human health as well as uh, sustainability from a climate and environmental perspective. And so we said, we need a name that is able to convey our rigorous focus on returns and our disciplined approach, our approach to investing, much like a Goldman Sachs, a Blackstone, a BlackRock. But we also want to make sure that we convey a message to our constituents that we do care deeply about the types of businesses that we're investing in, that there's a greater purpose behind our investments, that we're really clear on what our mission and vision is for improving the world uh, as it relates to people and planet. And we said, Think of brands like Patagonia as inspiration. And so that was sort of what we shared with the marketing agency. And after a, a long process, we landed on the name Ground Force, which ultimately stands, stands for, and a tagline we came up is grounded in excellence and a force for good. And so we think it completely marries the two main goals and priorities that we have. As investors, and so we're we're really excited about the name, the new the name change, and, and the brand, and as are the team, and it's been just a wonderful rallying cry for us as we plant, you know, sort of a flag in in the earth here with it, with this new fund and this new team and this new strategy. And it sounds amazing, actually, as you say that you did a great job. And so, can you share a little bit more about what you're actually investing in and what are you most optimistic about? I know, again, this is an area that you're deeply passionate. Any of the trends, even perhaps as we think of generative AI now, LLMs, everybody talks about that, right? How are you thinking about that impact on your investment and sustainability specifically? or health and fitness, and, and just to throw contradiction, perhaps this Ozempic drugs and obesity rising. Hey, right? I just read an article, an email came, there's more than 1 billion people or one in eight people worldwide uh, that are now estimated to have obesity, uh, which is based on a new study. So some of these numbers are just uh, astounding, right? So there's a lot of things we can do about it personally, but yeah, how, how are you thinking about it from investment perspective? Yeah. And, and by the way, your statistics, even more alarming, if you add not only obesity, but just overweight, Yeah, overweight and obese is something like 70% of the U.S. population today. It's, it's atrocious. It's a major problem. It is, it is complex. I can't say I have all the answers, but certainly what I do believe in is the food system is one area that can be and can be and needs to be fixed. It, there is scientific evidence that food certainly contributes to all of the chronic diseases that we're currently plagued with. You now, from diabetes to cardiovascular de disease to obesity can all be prevented and actually reversed through nutrition. Yeah, of course there are outliers. I don't wanna sort of, you know, I'm not gonna argue sort of that every single person could be, you know, with diabetes or cardiovascular disease can cure it through, through nutrition. But I'm gonna go on the record probably saying 90, 90% of, of these ailments can be treated with, with, with food and proper nutrition. And so some of the biggest trends that have to take place, forget even that are taking place, but it's the movement away from ultra processed foods. I mean, that is, you know, I think one of the number one killers in our society today is people eating packaged food that is just 
laden with seed oils and other other unnutritious ingredients that don't serve serve anyone well. And so I think that one of the biggest trends, as I said, is, is just this movement away from ultra processed foods. I think an area as it relates to that, as you get away from that and you move to food is medicine, this whole concept. And I think there are some interesting companies out there that are, are creating solutions where they're creating meals and platforms that uh, will ultimately become medically reimbursed by health insurers. I think that's a great start. And I think that's a huge area of development in an area we're spending a lot of time on. It's still early and nascent, but there are companies that are emerging and drug companies are beginning to wake up to understand that this is a solution and probably is even a more cost-effective solution than a lot of the other treatments that they have vis-a-vis -vis drugs, uh, particularly GLP-1s. Uh, which, you know, obviously on Zempic, you know, we've seen sort of a lot of talk in the marketplace. I think GLPs are being abused and they're not the solution for diabetes or weight loss. As I said, I strongly believe that most chronic diseases can be prevented and or reversed with proper nutrition and exercise. Taking a pill is not the long-term solution. In fact, I've seen some studies even that have proven that uh, that if you lose up to 60% of your, your lean body mass on GLPs, and 90% uh, of those patients actually end up just regaining the weight back. And so I, I think that isn't the solution in, in my mind. And as I said, I think with the right nutrition, people could solve a lot of these problems. Yeah. So thinking about where we go from this next, 2024 is here. There's lots that's happening, including election year. People are struggling with wait, there's the Gen AI technology, people are worried that it will replace us. What are some of the things that you think people should be doing more of or less of? And you can take this from any angle, whether even you want to look at it through your investment lens, where do you think are some of the opportunities uh, that each of us can take action and get just a bit better? I mean, my, my simple answer, uh, but I know it's always not so simple for people to execute on, but it's it's more exercise, more sleep, more healthy e eating, uh, more introspective thinking, more healthy reading, and less social media. <laughs> that would be my sort of my 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 thoughts around that. Uh, yeah, you've got to be really disciplined, and and I think with the right discipline around taking care of your physical and mental health will will. Is, is so beneficial and yet it's so hard for so many people. I, 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 I'd actually say for myself, I'm, I don't know what it is, whether I'm just call it lucky, but for whatever it is, I've always had some sort of, of ease with finding discipline in my life. And it's interesting. Someone recently asked me who's um, overweight and suffering from type two diabetes. And came to me saying like, you know, just I'm really struggling with it because I'm really having a tough time eating healthy and staying motivated to exercise. He's like, how do you do it? And I actually didn't say this to him, but the reality is, and I was embarrassed to say this, is I have the opposite problem. I have a really tough time not exercising and eating unhealthy because if I eat unhealthy, I feel terrible. I feel guilty. And if I don't exercise, I'm grumpy and I also don't feel well. So it's almost like a hard for me to even comprehend how someone wouldn't, you know, find it easy because I feel so much better. And maybe it's just that some people never get the chance to know how good you can feel when you are eating well and when you're taking care of your mind and you're reading quality books and quality research or whatever it might be versus wasting time scrolling on, on, on Instagram and TikTok and watching mindless TV shows. Uh, but for me, the feeling is euphoric. So I would just encourage people to, to go and spend some time, create those habits, because once you start, it's hard to stop, as, as you know. Like, yeah. When, when those healthy habits, frankly, I just can't imagine not being able to do that. We've talked about it with some of my guests on some other podcasts, and I always ponder about that too. And I also wonder, just because the experience you have so early in the childhood of understanding the benefits of the activity and how you felt if you actually do it early on, it just allows you to tap into understanding your potential and how different that feeling is. 
I would think so. I mean, there's certainly a lot of uh, studies from an academic perspective about the benefits of the earlier you start in in school, the more benefits you have throughout, uh, you know, depending on certain indicators and markers in the educational system. Uh, so it, I would assume that translates to to mental health, to physical health as well. Yeah. Speaking of a think there's a lot of just talks about the younger generation and some of the mental challenges they're struggling. I personally really believe if they just work out more <laughs> and add more activity, they will actually be better off and they will have less time for exactly what you mentioned, social media, and be thinking about uh, some of the mental problems because running on the court, I think, especially in tennis, going back to where we started, I just was so exhausted all the time because you spent all your energy chasing the yellow tennis ball that you don't have much time to think about some other problems. But Dan, it's been such a fantastic conversation. I could talk to you for hours and I know you have busy schedule back to back and very disciplined and organized. So maybe any last things you want to share out with the world and how can people find you or what's the best way to follow you? Anybody who wants to get in touch? Great. No, I re really appreciate it. Also could likewise keep this conversation going for, for a lot longer. I look forward to, to following up with you and getting on the tennis court too. Uh, yes. As far as people following me, I've become a, a bit more active on LinkedIn lately. So you can find me on LinkedIn and I've been sharing some of my thoughts around leadership and business and uh, you can follow me there. Excellent. I'll add it to the episode notes and I conquer. I enjoy reading your posts. So please continue. They're fun and insightful. So Great. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great, great. day. Thank you, Clara.